Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to share a bit of my work with you. What is particular about my study, um, of which that I would like to contribute to the literatures on global supply chains, fast fashion, transnational capitalism, and China studies, is that I argue in order for us to truly understand the global supply chains for fast fashion, we would have to deeply analyze and to understand transformations in personhood, land, and labor practices that are characteristic of China's post-socialist transformations. So one aspect that, are, that is key to my study are what's spaces that are colloquially called urban villages. And urban villages are unique in that they're former agricultural collectives that today continue to be held by um, um, and regulated by members of former Mao's agricultural collectives. And what's important is that they hold what's called the user rights to the land. And as um, what's key to having their positionality as, as, as holders of these user rights is that they are engaged with negotiations with the municipal government in the transfer of this land. And as this land and um, the conditions of suspension that these urban villages uh, find itself is that it enables uh, these migrant um, or uh, these uh, village landlords to hold off on the eventual transfer of their user rights and rent out spaces, commercial and residential spaces, to rural migrants who have entered into these urban villages and are engaged in um, transnational um, supply chains for fast fashion. And so many of these migrant laborers who come in searching for jobs in affordable housing um, are able to uh, rent commercial spaces, residential spaces, and even open up their own factories, warehouses, and fabric stalls, and call themselves boss. And many of the migrant laborers who work uh, for a couple hours a day are able to uh, work in temporary jobs before they move on into their next employment or um, enterprising venture. And so as a result of these, I would argue that urban villages as spaces of post-social transformations are key in facilitating the low-cost, just-in-time delivery of designer-inspired fashions that are characteristic of fast fashion. So Guangzhou is key to facilitating um, uh, global fast fashion and other types of commodities that we recognize as the made in China label um, because it stands as one of the cities um, in the first special economic zones that have um, engaged in experiments with market reform in the late 70s and early 80s. So Guangzhou with its proximity to Shenzhen and Hong Kong allows for um, for kinship networks um, that spanned um, into Hong Kong, the former uh, manufacturing hub, and to expand on the sort of um, foreign experiments in foreign capital and the experiments in free market enterprise and more importantly, on small scale entrepreneurial ventures. And um, so culturally, as a, a result of that, the spirits of entrepreneurialism, risk-taking enterprise, market-driven market activities, um, and this idea of being one's boss has been um, key to facilitating um, the dreams and aspirations for many of the migrants who have moved into these spaces to engage in uh, various manufacturing activities and enterprising ventures um, that have uh, mainly exploded ever since the introduction of early market reforms. So um, Guangzhou in particular is also very important because um, the entire city has been dotted by uh, urban villages, which I've explained are key to facilitating the low cost manufacturing capabilities that are uh, the fast fashion industries depend. So um, if uh, one never has the chance to visit Guangzhou, one would see uh, many of these spaces of, ur of urban villages or former urban villages that either have been uh, demolished or have been incorporated into city land. And in my field site in particular, what's really interesting is that this urban village 
remains in suspension, that many of the former agricultural collectives continue to engage with negotiations with the municipal government. And in the meantime, they've been able to pause or to um, use as a stopgap before the eventual transfer of the land and their user rights. And in between this, this during this pause, they've been able to rent out many of the spaces and infrastructure to allow migrant laborers to come in and to engage either in temporary work or in different practices of entrepreneurial enterprise, and eventually to serve and to build the infrastructures and the labor practices now that global fast fashion depend. So I argue that many of these household workshops that are colloquially called jia gong chang, they're characteristic of these urban villages that I describe, um, which in turn are critical in facilitating fast fashion uh, supply chains globally. And what's key to these small scale household workshop is that they're small and in some ways because that they're very informal, home-based, very kin-based type of uh, cultural spaces, um, they, it allows for many workers to float in and out, uh, many of the migrant bosses to welcome and to take in walking clients, and also to allow for a lot of flows of capital and commodities. And that's key, as I argue, to the global fast fashion industry is that it allows that flexibility to um, change styles according to the dictates of global consumers. And it also facilitates the low cost investments that are required to sustain these fast fashion. So as we may know, uh, fast fashion industry relies on the low cost almost um, just in time delivery of these items. And that because that they're so quick, uh, they draw upon or they're design inspired by designer styles. So uh, it's the combination of uh, the dictates of having um, reflecting sort of runway style, but offering low cost to consumers um, across different uh, class groups around the world, that it requires this type of small scale, very informal home base, uh, industrial and cultural sites. So in my study, I argue that it's more than just an economic necessity uh, for these units to emerge. These are also cultural aspects that are unique to urban villages, but also to um, the condition of uh, post-socialist transformations in urban China and in Guangzhou in particular, that that uh, sort of historical link that enabled uh, fast fashion industry to um, expand at the scale that we see it today. So what uh, I hope that my study will contribute to the larger literature on labor and China studies and uh, female working conditions um, in industries and in household labor is that it challenges the assumption that many of the made in China commodities that we take advantage that we take for granted are mass produced in large scale, almost um, dehumanized spaces. What I show in contrast is that so many of the supply chains of commodities, especially fast fashion, relies on face-to-face -face encounters in these informal household space, household workshops. And these face-to-face -face um, create the affect uh, down the supply chains from clients to uh, factory owners and to temporary workers that they hire um, that uh, all enable this sort of very fluid, mo mobile type of working conditions. So as I've explained earlier, many of these household workshops are informal, meaning that they're not operating based on formal contracts. And rather, they are many of the workers are paid by production order or by piece rate wages, and workers can flow in and out. 
Um, and what I've seen during my ethnographic research are moments in which migrant workers would uh, engage in arguments with factory owners when they don't disagree with the working conditions or they simply walk out of the job or they don't show up if they uh, choose to sleep in, um, in the mornings or in the late evenings. Um, and so it's this very mobile, flexible, temporary conditions of work uh, that uh, is sort of, one could argue that's characteristic of the post-Fordist era um, that we find ourselves in the present day. But I also argue that's unique to uh, post-socialist transformations in China and the changing working conditions that we see across Chinese uh, segments of Chinese society today. Um, namely, that type of informal, uh, very short-term based, um, not on formal contract types of labor, which in turn um, compels workers to view labor not as the conventional type of labor where it provides a platform for political status and, and the uh, leverage of political rights, but rather it's a stepping stone to entrepreneurship and what I called bosshood, um, different experiments in self-enterprise um, and uh, that engage in taking on risks and sometimes leaving many migrants in debt and um, in, um, in, in conditions of precarity. So what's particular that I found during my research is that um, within these small scale household workshops, uh, my, many of the migrants, whether they were migrant bosses or they were temporary workers that work only piece rate wages, they um, are there only temporarily or they describe their labor as a platform into some form of entrepreneurship. And this discourse, which has been documented and studied by many other um, um, scholars, um, uh, demonstrate the transformations um, of which uh, that have taken place in the past few decades as a result of market reform. Whereas during the Maoist period, labor was seen as a platform for political activity. Um, they were seen as the vanguard of the revolution. Now today, factory labor and piece rate um, labor is seen as mere stepping stone to being a boss and entrepreneurship. And what's appealing for many of the migrant groups across different class segments and across different backgrounds is that entrepreneurship allows them to kind of be their own control, uh, take control over the conditions of their labor and um, of the ways that they um, can, can claim some form of livelihood. And what's really interesting is that, um, that many of the migrants call themselves free, paradoxically, even though they work um, 10 to 12 hours a day, or they are under pressure to um, finish and complete a production order at the last minute. And for men in particular, freedom allows them to claim some form of masculinity and the dictates of their own labor and some aspect of pride. Whereas women, the idea of freedom allows them to fulfill um, the, and the double burden of their domestic labor as, as well as the industrial labor. And that's what I argue key to sustaining the small scale household workshops because uh, as I've explained, the, the key to household workshops is the idea of home or domesticity. And so for women, as they're working um, along the assembly lines, they are also taking care of their children in these industrial spaces, or they may be even taking care of other children. Uh, women also may be moving out in and out of the other types of small scale workshops and juggle different temporary jobs, multiple jobs throughout the day. Um, so 
despite um, whether a gendered or different class backgrounds, overall what I found is that their aspirations uh, lead them to build homes back in their home villages and to remit much of the income that they earn back to their families so that they can build intergenerational wealth that's tied mainly to the, uh, their hometowns in China's countryside. And this, of course, is related to the Hoko household registration system that keeps them back bounded to their native places and keeps them bounded as rural citizens, despite the fact their affective uh, and kin relations and their work uh, remains uh, anchored in Chinese cities far away from their homes. So what's really interesting about the particular urban village that I study and the ways that it intersect global fast fashion supply chains is that in the, during the first initial outbreak of uh, COVID-19 um, in Wuhan, um, many of the public um, have found out that many that this is also the site where migrants from Wuhan or around the surrounding towns of Wuhan have settled and moved precisely in the urban village where I study and engage in the fast fashion and low cost manufacturing of garments and accessories. Um, and as a result of the initial lockdowns in China in 2019-2020, many of the migrants from Hubei were not able, had lost their jobs or were not able to uh, continue to contribute and engage in uh, the manufacturing activities of fast fashion. And they were forced to move out of Guangzhou and try to return to Hubei. But as a result of the lockdowns in Wuhan, they were not able or not invited back to return and so many um, ended up in um, suspended uh, geographically and affectively not knowing uh, when or, or how they were able to return home and not knowing um, when they were able to resume work and to again to earn the wages that they that they live on now fast forward to uh, 2022 um, in the height, during the height of China's zero COVID policy, um, that level of precarity and suspension, in fact, had intensified. Um, because now, uh, many of the stringent lockdowns that uh, initially had only taken place in Wuhan during the initial outbreak now had um, become a policy nationwide and had, in fact, um, affected the very same urban village in which I studied. And so the very same migrants from Hubei Chun, Hubei village, um, that are uh, working in the urban village in Guangzhou found themselves quarantined in their homes um, and not able to uh, get food, uh, walk outside, or again to resume the businesses and the labor practices that their livelihoods depend. Um, and after a couple weeks, uh, cut off from their food supplies and other critical supplies that they needed on an everyday basis, they had no choice but to gather in collective protests against these quarantine measures. And so what's key and what I emphasize is that they were not protesting on the COVID policies to contain the virus per se, but they were protesting to um, resume the work and the livelihoods that they, that, that they critically depend. And as a result of these protests, it, ex it, it exposed to the public audience the precarity of the work, the vulnerability and the exploitative conditions that they were forced to engage in um, that ultimately contributes to the global fast fashion supply chains. Well, thanks for asking. So um, the upcoming book that I'll be working on uh, will uh, continue on the research on precarious accumulation by my first book. And my next project will be engaged in uh, young migrants who are um, also a part of this fast fashion industry, but now they're uh, heavily shaping the ways in which uh, 
uh, live broadcasting is taking place. And so uh, in the wholesale, very same wholesale markets where I've conducted research, young women would, would record themselves and perform various forms of live streaming, whether they're a type of auction-like selling of products or they're um, uh, serving, beginning to become these uh, very popular influencers now uh, in order to sell their own personalities, their own characteristics, and um, in turn, to sell the, the clothes um, as a form of living. And so uh, following along the global trends of fashion and the ways in which social media um, and digital media have shaped different ideas of beauty, fashion, and style, um, what I'd like to focus on is uh, these young aspirational entrepreneurs but have really taken on and shaped the landscape of digital media and the ways in which live streaming and different ideas of influencers um, are shaped by various notions of uh, gender and um, their, their uh their participation in the global fashion industries and the ways that they shape notions and assumptions of fashion and beauty.